here at the Disasters Emergency Committee. We've recently launched our appeal for the survivors of the devastating earthquake and tsunami that recently struck the Indonesian island of Sulawesi. I have a very exciting fundraising total to announce at the end of this broadcast, but before I do that, I'd like to introduce you to my guest today, is Michael, uh, Matthew Carter, Humanitarian Director at DEC member CAFOD. So Matthew, tell me, what are your teams on the ground um, saying about the situation in Sulawesi at the moment? The situation is really tough. Um, before the weekend when I was speaking to the teams, um, saying access is, is they're really struggling. Um, vehicles can get up to the outskirts of Palu, um, as we're seeing on, on the TV. And then um, our partners and DDC members are physically having to carry in goods to the most affected areas. And tell me, what exactly are CAFOD doing on the ground in, in Palu and around? I think the critical thing is getting in small amounts of food at the moment. So on Friday and over the weekend, we took in about seven metric tonnes of food and bottled water. Um, and now also looking to um, non-food items such as buckets and soaps and, and towels and, and just so people can start doing some of the normal everyday things. Mm. And one of the things you know you realise when you see the, the images from TV and stuff about this, um, the after effects of this devastating tsunami and, and the earthquake is that all the buildings have fallen down. So clearly um, people are having to sleep out in the open at the moment. So can you explain um, to people watching today what, um, how DEC members like CAFOD respond with shelter? What, what do people do when they've been affected like this? I think we take things like shelter and food and those day-to-day -day things for granted. Um, after an earthquake, people are clearly also traumatised. There will be after effects and, 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 and further earthquakes or small tremors. So people won't want to go near those buildings and they'll be fearful of the buildings. Um, but they'll also want to take shelter, um, and that's also critical, not from the rains at the moment, but because of um, just the sun and the burning heat. We learnt this in Bangladesh, actually temporary shelter is really important, so the, just putting up tarpaulins so people, particularly young children, mothers, can take shelter from the sort of midday sun. So is that what an emergency shelter kit contains? Tarpaulin and there may be ropes or something to attach it to trees or buildings? Exactly. And later on we provide perhaps bamboo and sort of basic um, wooden materials so that people can build a more permanent shelter or what we call semi-permanent. Semi-permanent. Yeah, I've seen those for myself in fact in Bangladesh. So people have get corrugated iron and bamboo to make a sort of temporary makeshift shelter. Exactly. We sort of talk about it in three phases. Temporary shelter, which is just literally tarpaulin, tarpaulin mm. that you tie up between mm. trees or old buildings. Mm. Um, interim or semi-permanent shelter, which is um, bamboo and wood mm -hmm. and corrugated iron. And then obviously moving forward to mm. sort of permanent shelter. And the rainy season is approaching. So at the moment, as you say, it's mainly protecting people from the heat, in fact, but they are just sleeping out in the open, mm -hmm. I take it. Yes, they are. Yeah. And then, but with the rainy season approaching, what would you be hoping to do to support them? I think, again, um, I'm putting up more temporary mm -hmm. um, or uh, shelter in the forms of um, 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 corrugated iron that, that can withstand the weather and high, high rain, heavy rains. And how are your teams, you know, we've read a lot about how um, you know, roads are impassable and people can't get big trucks through. So how are they getting all of this equipment in to help people? Well, it's incredible. DUC members and their local partners, this is community-based organisations, are ca physically carrying in the supplies into the centre of the town um, and the city, you know, that has been so badly damaged. I mean, the, the, the numbers might seem relatively small but I mean these are whole communities that have been decimated and we're talking about um, not just it's the combined effects of both the earthquake um, um, and, and, and the tsunami or huge tidal wave that's brought about such devastation I mean just mud sludge just, it's mm. sort of boiling mud that sort of swamped over houses and communities and we still don't know how many people are actually lost which is terrifying no I know, I, I know we've seen all of those absolutely devastating images. So tell me though in the longer term, how um, the wider response from uh, CAFOD and other DEC members, how is that all coordinated? Coordination is central and it's been part of what the DEC has been about for many years. The DEC coordinates within its UK membership, but also we are one part of a, an international system. So that coordination, particularly with government, UN, is, is essential. 
But the critical bit and where DUC is so good is working with local community. I mean, listening to people, seeing how we can work with them to rebuild you know, their shattered lives. And that's, that would be an essential bit that the DUC would be leading on in the future. Well, thank you for joining us today, Matthew. As I said earlier, we uh, have a very exciting fundraising total to announce. Since we launched our appeal just a few days ago, we've raised an amazing £10 million thanks to all of your support. But as you heard from Matthew, we really, really do need much more support. Um, we've talked a lot today about shelter, and £30 can buy a family a shelter kit. Um, that's tarpaulin and ropes to provide some temporary relief from the sun and somewhere to sleep at night. So please, please do continue to, do, to donate at dec.org.uk. Thank you.